don't have one of these, uh, you should ask Margaret for one of the slips of paper that she's carrying uh, so that you can have lunch. <laughs> And then uh, bring this to, to, uh, to lunch. You'll need that for your meal. OK, uh, it gives me uh, a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dean Yivarbuk. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced that exactly correctly, but from, uh, uh, from the Wardican uh, Land Management Limited. Um, and uh, I think uh, Dean probably has the distinction of having spent the most hours in the air uh, to get here. <laughs> uh, 30, what, 36 or something like that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, John Altman, who is uh, um, uh, an old friend and colleague uh, whom I met, I think, the, for the first time in 1988. Uh, at a conference in Darwin, and then I spent, I had uh, the, the, the real pr privilege of spending some time at the Center for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research at Australian National University in, I think it was 1990, uh, and John was director, and, and we've had a long association um, dating from that time. Uh, so, uh, and, and John has, uh, has moved on, he's, he's emeritus professor at uh, ANU and uh, has moved on to uh, a position at Deakin University. I will turn it over to you guys. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to begin by just um, acknowledging uh, the wonderful welcome from uh, Conrad Siwi uh, yesterday onto Wendat country. Um, it's terrific to be here um, on a One Nations um, country. Um, Dean and I uh, go back even further than Colin and I. Uh, we've been working together uh, in Arnhem Land since 1979, um, which I think by my bad mathematics is about 37 years. Um, and um, the way we want to uh, divide our presentation is that I will um, just say some big picture things um, in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. And then Dean will say some things about his country uh, in Arnhem Land and its uh, management and some very positive uh, programs that are in place to protect the cultural and environmental values of Indigenous lands uh, in North Australia. Um, in terms of language, on that long flight across the Pacific Ocean, I talked to Dean about his languages. He speaks 18 Indigenous languages and two non-Indigenous languages, one English and one Creole. I asked the translators about the 18 Indigenous languages, but they couldn't help us. So Dean will speak uh, in English. Uh, and uh, it will be translated into French uh, and into Spanish. The picture I have to start with on my presentation is um, of a relative of Dean's uh, burning country, not far from where, De where Dean was born, um, in remote tropical savanna Arnhem Land. This man, Jimmy Jabrali, uh, is asserting his right to burn his country, his political jurisdiction over his lands. Does that? We're stuck just with the PowerPoint. Ah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. 
these uh, four maps, uh, we, we always seem to go back to statistical or spatial picturing. These four maps tell you a story. Um, you can't see it very clearly, but in 1788, the Australian continent of 7.7 .7 million square kilometres was covered by about 300 First Nations, as they're called now. By 1964, brutal colonisation or invasion meant that there was no recognition of Aboriginal land rights in Australia. And the population had decreased by 1964 from about a million people to about 100,000 Indigenous people. In 1990, by 1993, with land rights, um, about 13% of the continent had been returned to forms of Aboriginal ownership. And by 2014, with uh, native title recognition and native title law after the Mabo judgment, uh, about one third of Australia is now under some form of Indigenous title. And you can just see that a little bit more clearly here. Um, I think the pointer will work, if I, oh, the pointer will work. Um, uh, oh, yep. This is, um, the orange is land rights. The blue is native title, exclusive possession. This is an interesting term, exclusive possession. It means you can't exclude miners. <laughs> and the yellow is non-exclusive possession. But these three titles now add up to one third of the continent. And we're going to talk about this area up here in Arnhem Land, which is tropical savanna, about 100,000 square kilometres, and only 10,000 indigenous people living there. This is a map that terrifies Australians. Um, the grey shows land where you've had registered claims. And when that claims process is completed, perhaps 70% of Australia will be under some form of Indigenous title. But all the grey area will become like the yellow. It'll be non-exclusive possession or shared possession, which means that Indigenous people will not have any rights that are different from non-Indigenous people. And what that means, again, is that they won't be able to exclude uh, activities like mining on their land. So, so it's only where you have the orange that you have free prior informed consent rights. But these are very powerful rights in the Australian context. This is one picture of Indigenous communities. These are called uh, in terms of statistical picturing, discrete Indigenous communities. There are about 1,200 of these communities in Australia, but their population of these discrete communities totals about 100,000 people. And about 1,000 of these communities have less than 100 people each. They're very, very small communities. And the big communities were the old government settlements and missions, and now, the small communities are where people have gone back to live on their traditional lands. But there's enormous controversy in Australia about whether the government will recognise people's citizenship rights when they go back to live on their land. This is another way of looking at the Indigenous population. You can see that where you've had most colonisation, you've got the most Indigenous people but the least land. So the land where people live is very remote and much of it in here is what's called desert Australia. Up here you've got tropical Australia. But these lands were returned to Aboriginal people because they were unalienated and they had, it was assumed that they had no commercial value historically, which is why they were returned to Indigenous people when for social justice reasons and legal reasons, you had land rights and native title. This uses Escobar's term of territories of difference. You can see there's some places where 80% plus of the population is indigenous, where you have land rights and native title exclusive possession. But in Australia as a whole, the population is 3% indigenous, and you have 
far fewer rights and land for most Indigenous people. Just, it's very important to clarify, we're talking about people who live here on lands where they're able to reoccupy the lands and form the majority of the population. Whoops, I'll just go back. This is just a map um, to show you the change in the recognised Indigenous population of Australia. Indigenous people were only counted in the Australian census from 1971. Before then, they were constitutionally excluded from being counted. So you had terra nullius, land belonging to no one, and you had Indigenous people assumed almost to non-exist in Australia until 1971. And in the first census, 115,000 Indigenous people were counted. In the 2011 census, 548,000 Indigenous people counted, a population of about 660,000 estimated by now maybe 800,000 Indigenous people. Just something about the land and its values. Australia is a very mineral rich country. This map shows you, it's a very busy map, I apologise for that, but it shows you 200 operating mines and all these little dots. It's not a dot painting like they do in Australia. It's showing the uh, known mineral reserves and what you can see is that most of them are in the southeast and southwest and on Aboriginal lands. There's only a few mines so far. These lands are often unexplored as yet for mineral deposits. Mines look like this. This is the Ranger Mine, it, right next to Dean's country. This is a uranium mine next to a national park, World Heritage National Park. Here is Jibbity Jibbity, the lightning, uh, sorry, the deaf adder dreaming. This landscape where people have spiritual connection has been devastated by a uranium mine. In 2020, this mine closes and this land is supposed to become, look like this when it's rehabilitated. That's been dug out in 30 years. There's five years to rehabilitate. This is another mine at the other end of Arnhem Land in Gove. And this is an alumina plant in Gove, which has just closed down. So the jobs that Indigenous people could have had here but didn't work here have disappeared. The question of closing, coping with closure looms large for Indigenous people. Even though they haven't benefited directly from mining, they will nevertheless feel the economic consequences of closure from these large mines and they will feel the environmental consequences. There's another way of looking at indigenous land. This is vegetation condition across the continent. The green, just take my word for it, the green is good and the brown is bad. And where you have intensive colonisation, you've had transformed and replaced vegetation. And where you have indigenous lands that historically were of no value, now you have high biodiversity values. You can see this again. These are just some resource atlas maps. Currently threatened species, where you have people and commercial development, you have loss of habitat and loss of species. Where you have indigenous lands, you still have threats, but biodiversity is strongest and is most, um, you know, um, th th these areas are most environmentally intact. So in Australia, we have now over 70 Indigenous protected areas, covering nearly one third of the Australian conservation estate. These are areas that are owned by Aboriginal people that have been placed back into the conservation estate and the government assists these indigenous protected areas with funding. These are, you can see all these little dots, whoops, all these little dots here. These are all ranger groups. Indigenous people now manage um, nearly one million 
square kilometres of land with 800 ranges that are paid for by the Australian government. This is not a very good ranger to square kilometre ratio, but it's probably one of the most progressive uh, programs that we've seen in Australia in terms of supporting Indigenous aspirations to look after their land. And this program costs about 500, sorry, yeah, about, sorry, $50 million per annum to run. So it's quite a significant program, but it doesn't generate that many jobs for these 72 protected areas. This is a picture of the conservation estate. Um, again, you can see the Aboriginal land in pink, the Indigenous protected areas are in blue, and other Australian conservation areas are in green. And they're about half-half in terms of the coverage. But you can see also that Aboriginal lands cover from north to south a huge part of the continent. And what I want to do now, this is meant to be clever, but it's also a little bit tricky. You go from that picture, which shows what happens continentally with those colours, and you now move to the Kakadu West Arnhem region, which Dean is going to talk about. And here you can see World Heritage, Kakadu National Park. This is land that's under claim, but it will all become Aboriginal owned land under land rights law. And this is the two Indigenous protected areas, Wadakan and Jelk, which also cover 20,000 square kilometres. They have a population of about 5,000 people. They're very remote places. And the company that Dean and I are directors of, Garagut Gunji, Garagut refers to the uplands. This is the escarpment. Gunji refers to the lowlands. And these two indigenous protected areas work together. Dean owns country here and he owns country here. So he has a foot in both these indigenous protected areas. And I'll just go back to my picture of uh, Jimmy Jalbrali burning his country before I hand over to Dean to make the presentation about the Wadakan indigenous uh, protected area, which is run by a company guaranteed by, limited by guarantee called Wadakan Land Management Limited. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I go, go ahead and tell my story, first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, First Nation for bringing me out here and sharing my experience and knowledge from our indigenous people from Australia uh, where I work. And I want to thank uh, Professor John Altman that long years between him and I, I worked in different part of the uh, country, but also worked in the same path, uh, you know, working with the indigenous people um, in the last 30, 37 years ago. Um, my uh, uh, presentation is uh, talking about the Wadigan uh, protect, protected area using a fire um, for our uh, management in that particular area. As John explained uh, about the indigenous protected area, Wadigan protected area, on the left, on the left hand side, as you can see, on this uh, uh, yellow square mark, it's a protected commonwealth protected area. Uh, on the other side is the uh, indigenous protected area, which is uh, run by what again indigenous uh, uh, people.
how, uh, how fire was used in the past. We use fire for, for many reasons. Not only just uh, using fire for our conservation management, but also healing process for our, for our land, for our people, for our native uh, plants and animals. Uh, it's, fire is a tool that we use from beginning from millennia time until today, we're still um, uh, using this fire as a tool. Even though our government trying to restrict our burning regime, you know, stopping us from burning our country, but we continue burning without even, you know, um, uh, getting in trouble. But a lot of the imposed uh, uh, signage has been put down on the road when we come across it, do not burn, otherwise you'll be fined or go sent to jail for 15 years or whatever, you know. But that didn't occur to our uh, understanding, but we just keep on burning until the, such a time that we um, got ourselves um, in, in a program as a land management and the fire was seen as a central part of our, our mechanism on, in using in land management programs. Why we, why we did use these fires? Because there's so many reasons we use these fires, protecting our homes, protecting our, uh, our, uh, our stories, uh, protecting our, you know, our paintings, and also our, uh, country that needed to de um, degrade, we used to fire rather than heavy machineries coming down with the dozers or you know, with the heavy machineries just clearing out. But for our use, for developing and for co conservation use, the fire was a tool that has been passed down from many generation to generation up until our generation still, are we still using our fire? How did uh, our people use fires? Because there's, there's many ways we use these fires. They are, um, you know, young and old, uh, young at being practicing, but we keep an eye on young ones, making sure that, you know, uh, you know, they play games in the right way rather than burning in the wrong places or, you know, burning in a big patch. But we, we give uh, young ch people opportunity to look after and to, and to learn how to use these fires and how to burn in particular area and uh, to make a, a particular um, uh, flushing, you know, for hunting purposes of flushing animals out from the scrub. During the colonization uh, um, when it began back in the 1700 or 1600, People were eager, running, you know, going down to the coastal region and seeing what is happening. Uh, a lot of the uh, um, sighted things down in the coastal region, people came back with the stories. As they started to paint the stories on, on the rock art. Uh, this is a, a, one of the ships that has been seen down in the coastal region, uh, so people Round to uh, run, you know, went back to the um, escarpment and telling stories by painting uh, on the rocks. And here, there's a um, uh, they spotted the horses, horse, and, and many other things. Also, the rifles um, being shown. And they drew all these stories, so letting people know what what they saw. When they, when they went to, um, down in the coastal regions. Because the message got real, you know, message was, you know, going faster than, you know, people's ears. Because the eyes and the ears of people are there watching and sharing the stories, what they saw when they came out to these, uh, you know, in various areas uh, up in the um, lowland areas. Empty landscape, no people. Uh, this is what made uh, what made our people more concerned. Uh, in those years, mission and settlement was set up by missionaries and government settlement. We were forced to live in the uh, in the urban community set up by uh, missionaries or a government settlement, and leaving our country so often 
people without no land, uh, land without a people. So people um, just in recent years, uh, back in 19, 1990s, 1989 and 1990s, people were really worried about the wildfires were coming in from um, you know, four corners of uh, uh, areas and you know, burning country very severely. And you know, uh, we didn't know what's been happening out there. But later on in the years, that we had our friends as a, um, a, science from, a scientist from the bushfires, NT, started to come talk to us about, uh, about the wildfires. Have we known that wildfires coming to our place? And, uh, and a, lot of, a lot of the uh, elders, a lot of the professors, were starting to get worried because there was nobody in that particular estate up in the Scarpin, right here, was looking after that country. And people are saying, this place we left, it's now, it's very sad. Now the country is being burned uh, and no one's looking after it. All our animals on our land, our sacred aspects, you know, things are, are going away. So um, in 1990s and to 2000, we started to group up together and start talking, talking about getting our people back on the landscape and manage and look after the country that we, it's supposed to be looked after. This uh, area, a very, very rugged country, inaccessible by road. There's only one little track we can get in and out. There's no other highway or there's no other road that we can go in through there. Here in this little community, there's another, you know, uh, um, in Maningrida, this is where I was born and raised and where this is where I got educated. I set it up the ranger program there called uh, Jack Ranger Program. After that, uh, when I you know, uh, got a bit more interested in helping this other group here, so I went out there because of my families and you know, uh, uh, kind of work that I do. I want to try and see things that, you know, want to see things change. So we continue, I continue working with this group until by year 2006. Seven, um, we ended up uh, setting up the program called uh, Water Again Land Management. Uh, to do, uh, all the people of Escarpment came and formed together and set up the program called Indigenous Land Management. By 2009, um, it was um, then declared as an indigenous protected area, and everyone, all the families from the Water Again area were very, very happy because there was an opportunity for our young, our young people, uh, giving them a jobs out there, making sure that, you know, we keep them there. And also young people need to learn that country as well. So, so did I want to learn because it's all new to us, all together. Uh, in our community, we've got a lot of problems today with the feral animals, that's uh, Asian buffaloes. Uh, back in the 1980s, uh, there were very uh, strong, uh, 1980s, there was a lot of big shootout uh, bec from the government because of uh, uh, brucellosis and tuberculosis uh, on, you know, seeing that animals had a disease, but they were quite wrong. But uh, a lot of the animals, uh, Asian buffalo, they were clean meat, but anyway, they got rid of it. But later on, they found out those animals are very clean. They didn't have any uh, foot and mouth, or they didn't have any other uh, TB on them. Uh, we have um, a problem with the weeds uh, also. Our, our rangers uh, do a lot of spraying weeds and, and, so, and so on. Talking about the wildfires, a lot of severe burn occurs by accident, or someone's on the road trying to chuck matches without even understanding the nature of the rules and regulation in our traditional ways. But some young fellows, young people who go camping out to these chuck matches don't care anything about the rules and regulations. Uh, in this section here, this is all the cypress pine that give us an uh, indication of uh, how, long, how long ago this uh, severe uh, burn has been going on in these uh, particular areas. So when we see this indication, it, it throws our mind that, you know, uh, how long this uh, been burning. Um, also, uh, in telling us a story about 
our old people, our senior professors saying, this area wasn't burned like this. When we were here, we were managing it. We were looking after this country in a way that our ancestors were looking after us. Now, when we're coming back here, sharing this, uh, showing you in this area, it's, you know, it's going away. This country is being burned rapidly, year by year, when we weren't here. Now we're coming back, we wanna try and, we wanna try and see the fire regime need to be changed, need to be looked after as we were looking after from millennium ago, from our great, great grandfathers and, you know, and so on. Also, this uh, water buffalo, or Asian buffalo, uh, they are uh, ferals, but also they became a, they also became a meat for our people, and we recognize that it's uh, very, you know, uh, we can, um, you know, we can feed a family about 200 or 100, 100 people just for, from one buffalo meat, uh, animals. How we use fires today, there are many ways of using uh, fire. Uh, we've got a friends of, um, uh, scientist friends who, you know, works with us. We're using two, two ways. We use uh, scientific uh, Western kind of uh, knowledge. We use uh, also our traditional uh, knowledge on our landscape, how to burn, because we've been burning this country for millennium, and now extra knowledge coming from the Western side, we use uh, uh, tools that, uh, we never used before. Now we're using tools that we can go on a chopper, helicopter, or we use uh, you know, some sort of uh, machine that we go out and mark the area where how to burn and where to burn. And according to our rules, we need to burn, right people need to burn their own country. So each time, every year, we get landowners of the country, they go and burn on the country. And we can't stop uh, people going on hunting and going hunting and burning their country on their own country, we can't stop that. They stay on, you know, land. But we need to, we always tell them, make sure you know the firebreak is already up there. And when you go out hunting, you need to burn that according, you know, your own way for your, you know, hunting. At least there's a firebreak. Uh, Sometimes the wildfires just continue going, you know, going on and on, but there's a uh, capable of uh, young fellows, uh, always out there, keep an eye on it. If there's any wildfires, they uh, clap all the young fellas and go out and you know, try and stop the, f the wildfires happening. Here we have a lot of consultation with the traditional owners. Before we, uh, yearly, we go out and do a burning. Uh, we talk to uh, many different landowners uh, in, 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 in this uh, White Again region, also in the Jalk area as well. Uh, on, on ground burning, we have a lot of people, whether they are rangers or the traditional owners are going out, they are doing uh, burning as well. But in the early burning, uh, you know, at, the, at the particular time for us to go out and burning, not late burning. Otherwise, if you're late burning, it just go, the, the fire will go berserk. Aerial burning, as you can see, uh, some traditional owners, uh, working, we you know tell TOs to go and burn. They jump on an helicopter um, and go out and do their burning around the, their clan east side. Um, as you can see, this uh, what again district is a Mount Elchip here. Uh, uh, when this is a cool burning, it's not real wild. It's, you know, uh, down in the southern part and in Sydney or wherever, you, you, you probably heard a story about Black Friday or Black Wednesday. It kill, killing you know, many, uh, uh, many houses and you know, a few people have died from, uh, from fire down in the southern region. But in the territory uh, in Arnhem Land, you know, there are a lot of, uh, we've got people out there on the ground all the time, our rangers and our traditional owners working together. When, fire, uh, when uh, uh, wildfires um, occur in, in top of this plateau, there's a mixture of uh, teams fighting these fires. There's a woman and a man working together because all of these, uh, it's all of these uh, guys, girls and boys, they're very new in this program, but they've been taught how to do it. 
by you know by um, you know our, our friends uh, also in our traditional thinking okay let's let get our people out there you know give them a job so young fellows young women also you know are active the this wildfires you know okay this this you know this time of the year they always um, alert because the wildfires because we keep an eye on the uh, nephew fire information uh, areas we, you know that's where it let us know there's a wildfire zone. We, we team up against and go out and, and trying to stop the fires. How we use fires in helping our, our people and our environment because, you know, up in this plateau is very rich, very rich and also beautiful and also uh, land was managed before, before, you know, uh, colonization. It's been, you know, it's been, you know, but there was many different animals and uh, things was living in this area. But now, now we're going back and doing a lot of surveys. We're trying to find these animals who are living in this, but it's, it's, it's like, you know, they're going away. Now we've got the threats come, came in. Cane toad, you know, is out there. Now it's cane toad is up in this carpet. For our fire management, it supports our livelihoods and conservation, the welfare. And this is an area where now, now we still, you know, trying to put more people on our landscape, and we're trying to create a satellite, range, satellite base ranger camps in our regions. So making sure that all, all our, in in our APA area, we want to have a lot of people, landowners sitting on the country and managing it and working together. Uh, with our uh, ranges. Here, impact of the uh, fire regime. As you can see, the yellow, uh, the orangey part is just back in those uh, bit one before before we got into uh, a this program. In this, it tells us from those beginning time when we um, when we first started. This uh, it's a very high fire the re in a wildfire has been occurring in that time but in 2007 uh, thing was changed by year 2011 and 11 and 13 we could prove it that we you know we changed the whole fire regime it became an you know this blue become a really um, tell us that we are you know we are doing our best as we can Uh, impact of fire management using the fire reduction total areas is that's, um, from 1995 to 2013, as you can see, um, 2006, uh, 1996, and 2004, there was uh, the high fire uh, impact of fire burning in that regime. But from 2004 to 2013, we can maximize, we can see how how uh, systems work and how people is on the ground there are managing uh, the land because of cool burning and all that. Impact of welfare annual projects, income of 1.4 million Australian dollars, supporting five indigenous ranger groups, managing 2.8 million hectares, reducing environmental damage, uh, reducing uh, in environmental damage, engaging more than 240 local uh, people Per year, there are now similar projects are covering about 10 million hectares in northern Australia. I'm sorry, I'm going a bit fast because I've got a limit of this. Welfare means uh, water again land management. As you can see, uh, the uh, on ground burning. We've got uh, families bringing kids from us from communities to a homeland like this. With this old lady uh, talking to them. Uh, we have a bushwalking as well. We bring young people going out camping and walking. This is me and my daughter and my wife walking, uh, crossing over the uh, river. Uh, this is our camp, base camp at uh, Wadigan Land Management. Here, there's some rangers are you know, uh, doing a work. Thank you very much.
I think we have time for uh, uh, one or two uh, quick questions, comments. Katie. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. Is there a ban on burning even on the orange colored indigenous owned lands? Uh, in, in a nutshell, no. Um, so where people have uh, land rights, um, they uh, can burn country. Um, but, but part of the reason they can burn, I mean, the, the regulation is contested, but these are extraordinarily uh, remote areas. And historically, when uh, state authorities have tried to stop burning, uh, they've, they've failed because it's actually very difficult to stop people lining country. So now, basically, they uh, allow people uh, to burn country. And there's also a recognition that that early dry season burning that occurs um, is very positive. So what Dean was showing is, in fact, that you've now got agreements where people are paid uh, for the um, carbon offsets, the abatement that they produce. And, and that's basically encouraged with contractual work that they do for the Commonwealth Government of Australia. Monica. Yeah, thank you for uh, great presentations. Um, I had a question, John, about you mentioned that there are controversies around uh, government recognition of the status of returning peoples. Mm. I wonder, in addition to that, if there are other issues with the reintegration of people back into, into communities, and particularly if, if Dean has experienced that with his community. Um, look, Dean can certainly uh, talk about that a lot, but um, and, and he's actually, um, you know, termed the, the used the, the English terminology of orphaned country. You know, so country that's lost its people, because uh, for a long time, uh, the policy of the Australian government, uh, as in other settler colonies, was to uh, assimilate people, to eliminate uh, native societies through integration. And the way they did that in Australia initially, of course, was by, uh, you know, indiscriminate shooting of Indigenous people. But in the late 20th century, that sort of uh, approach was unacceptable. Uh, I think the last uh, official massacres in Australia were in the 1930s, as recently as that. But now, basically, um, people are eliminated, their native societies are eliminated by projects of centralisation, sedentarisation, and in inverted commas, civilisation. And people really have to struggle to get back onto their lands, and governments uh, don't really uh, support them. There was a short period um, when there was an era, what was referred to um, as government-defined self-determination, where people were given choice to return back to their lands and assisted, but in the last 20 years, that there's been a, a, a neo-colonisation, a neo-assimilation process going on, where governments have been much more reluctant to support people to live on country. And so, while Dean's story that he tells is very positive, these people um, are really struggling against the Australian state. I know in some of the other cases we're looking at, um, in Kenya and in uh, Colombia. Uh, you, you have um, very uh, clear violence uh, against people, but in Australia uh, you have uh, more subtle forms of structural and economic violence occurring uh, where people's life ways uh, are fundamentally uh, being denied uh, by the, the Australian state. Um, it's much easier uh, to manage people and to open up country for uh, mainstream forms of development like mineral uh, extraction if you clear the land of people. And so people are struggling uh, to get back onto country. And Dean, I don't know if you want to add to that. No, that's very true. Uh, in those, uh, there's a lot of hardship from our um, government, whether it's a state <coughs> or a federal, because uh, in those years uh, we've been neglected of our own uh, of our own country, we've been pushed back to the uh, settlement where it, uh, mission or missionaries or government settlement was established. And it just recently is that, you know, uh, what, what came to about in our ideas because there was, you know, con our country was burning severely and we want to, you know, a lot of people 
uh, want to go back. Back in 1976, when the land right movement, uh, then there was an opportunity for us to go and going back to our landscape and resettle. But um, during the years went by, uh, government stopped funding our outstretched uh, homeland movement. They took away our education. They took, uh, took away our linguist program. They took away our adult education program. So all being centralized in, in the communities rather than having education out in the bush uh, close to our estate. Uh, one quick one. Okay. Dean, um, I have always been thinking, of course, of land and people, but I have never had such a clear and moving statement like what you said, the land without people that gives this sense of how the land is missing, the people that know how to cherish and use it. So thank you. And with your permission, I'd like to cite you sometimes because it really went to my heart. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, uh, I don't know if the, is the Skype aspect of this going to work? Uh, is it lined up? Great. Okay. So, um, in uh, uh, present on Skype uh, is. Uh, uh, will be Gabriela Gámez of the uh, uh, Isuma TV and Digital Indigenous Democracy. This is a, a, a project of Isuma. Uh, she's the project manager of uh, Isuma TV. And uh, Katie Sinclair, uh, uh, a, a doctoral candidate at McGill University, who's been working in partnership uh, with Gabriela. Good morning, everyone. So our presentation will be in English, but I have Gabriella's part of it printed out on, uh, in Spanish. I have about eight handouts for anyone who's using Spanish to English translations. So I'll just circulate those. So first of all, thank you very much to the Huron Wendat First Nation for welcoming us to their territory. And thank you, Gabriella, for joining us on Skype. So Gabriella, as Colin mentioned, is the project manager for Isuma TV and Digital Indigenous Democracy. She's joining us today from Mexico, and she's bilingual in both Spanish and English. So during discussion, please feel free to address her in either language for questions. So I'm going to just introduce Isuma TV a little bit and outline the mining project that's happening in Nunavut. And then Gabriella will speak to what Isuma TV is doing around that project, as well as language and cultural revitalization. So 
Isuma TV is an Inuit film, TV, and digital media organization based in Nunavut. Here's a map of Canada. Nunavut is just in the light blue there at the top. It's the largest territory out of all the provinces or territories in terms of land mass. Isuma TV is a, also has a collaborative multimedia platform for indigenous filmmakers and media organizations, which Gabriella will speak more to. Their online component is in Inuktitut, English, Spanish, and French, and then with lots of media content of different indigenous languages, I think about 80. In terms of their work about the mine that we'll talk about, they work on, in part, inform, consult, consent, and monitoring, as well as inter-community communication, promoting human rights, language, and cultural rights. So Isuma TV is based in Igloolik, Nunavut. This is a picture of Igloolik. It's one of the five communities deemed most effective by the mine we're going to talk about. It's about 2,000 people, and most people's first language is Inuktitut, and most also speak English as well. This is just a close-up <coughs> map of Nunavut here. You can see, may I use the um, laser pointer, please? Oh, it's here. You can see um, Igloolik right here. And the mine is located between Igloolik and Pond Inlet. Pond Inlet's right here, so it's about there. So going back to our map of Canada, that means the mine is located right about here. Here's a close up. So again, Igloolik and these five affected North Baffin communities, Hall Beach, Arctic Bay, Pond Inlet, Clyde River. So the mine is an iron ore mine. It's called the Mary River Project, and it's operated by Baffinland Iron Mines. It was approved in 2013, at which point they started construction, and the mine signed an Inuit Impact Benefit Agreement, an IIBA, with the regional Inuit organization. So this document outlines some of the rights and benefits that each parties have to each other. Before the mine was approved, it went through the permitting processes, which is run by the Nunavut Impact Review Board, or NERB. It's the regulatory or permitting body in Nunavut that makes decisions on whether mines are allowed to operate on the territory. And this, it was at this point that Asuma TV really started to get involved. So many different players participate in the NERB process, including community consultations. However, there are many different barriers for Inuit to full participation and full rights and benefits from the NERB process, and Asuma TV wanted to help um, improve some of these rights. There's often this assumption in Canada that if companies comply with Canadian legal standards, they will meet all human rights requirements. However, this is not always the case, especially when it comes to Indigenous stakeholders. So, for example, in the IIBA, it outlines some rights and benefits to Inuit legally, but these rights and benefits are not always manifested. So to just give a very brief run through of what the mine looks like, here you have the main deposit. Inuit have rights during the mining of this deposit itself, which is about 20 years. However, the mine is projected to be about 100 years once all the deposits are mined out. And in the front here, you have a crusher. So basically, this whole mountain is iron ore, some of the purest in the world at about 65%. So by the end of the project, this mountain will basically be just a hole in the ground. So ore is taken from the top, placed on haul trucks, driven down the deposit. Then they're crushed and loaded onto these large trucks called B trains. And they're driven along the tote road to the ore stockpile at the inlet. Then they're loaded onto this conveyor belt during the ice-free season, where it's shot onto boats that will dock here, and then shipped out in front of Pond Inlet. So the mine has actually recently indicated their intention to apply for an icebreaker amendment. So right now, they only ship here during ice-free season. So about once every 16 hours, you have a large barge going through here. This, is, this area is significant because this Violet Island is an area where a lot of people from Pond do hunting and harvesting and recreation. So during the ice-free season, it's okay to continue to boat across, but if 
icebreakers start breaking a channel through this ice during the winter, people will not be able to traverse over to their traditional territory. So that's one example of a contemporary problem that's coming up with the mine. And here's just a small video of, the, of a blast. It's a little off in the distance, but well, perhaps it won't play. Well, that's okay. So now I'll just switch over to Gabriella. Oh, just a moment, Gabriella. I will. Is that correct to connect her with Skype? I've pushed step in. Is that correct? The presentation has been, oh, fantastic, great. <coughs> Can I turn that up from here? No, oh, thank you. And do I need to put the microphone close for translation? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Put the ear set by the laptop. But for the translators to hear Gabriella, do I need to put oh, this mic? Oh, okay, perfect. Okay. Thanks. Go ahead, Gabriella. I was in front of him, so I read my hand and I looked at the hand. See? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Fantastic. So I'm going to do it in English, but you can, I can switch to Spanish anytime. Um, hi, my name is Gabriella. Uh, and I will tell you a little bit about um, Isuma TV, what it is, and uh, uh, maybe I can share my screen here, and you can see the presentation. Tell me if you can see the presentation there. Yes. yes. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, can, like, can you read the letters that yeah. they're on the presentation? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So, um, what is the TV is, is uh, it's a website that I actually can show you, um, and you can go anytime. It's a website that right now it's in syllabics, in, um, it's made by Inuit, so it's in the language of the Inuit in Inuktitut, uh, Romance and Syllabics, it's in English, French, and Spanish. We can add any other language to this platform. It's a platform, here is a, it's the home page that you can see. It's a platform that was made uh, by Inuit, but for Inuit and other indigenous people around the world. Uh, you can see that there's like different channels and different videos. It's like um, kind of like a YouTube if you want for indigenous people, but it's more than that. People can create their own channels, their own space. It's um, the best way to see this is as if it's a, a television, an international television, where individuals or indigenous organizations can have their own channels and upload their own videos, their own photos, their own PDFs. So have their own website if you want. If you go here to the communities, you can see that there are various communities and that up until now, there's about 80 indigenous language from all around the world, from Russia, Australia, Greenland, uh, different places in Latin America, the States, Canada, and that there is another area where communities have their own page. I'm gonna go back to the presentation to give you a little bit more of, um, of a context. So, 
Right now, this platform has about a thousand channels, but uh, more than 6,000 videos. We do not own the right of these videos. We just uh, provide the platform and the people who upload their videos, the indigenous organizations around the world who upload their videos own their own videos. Uh, so all we do is to provide a plat platform to help people communicate, to help the, the indigenous communities to communicate among themselves with other indigenous people, with governments, with mining um, uh, companies. Um, there's about, right now, there's about 1,340 Inuit videos. That means different Inuit organizations have uploaded these videos, not only us. There's 900 of these videos are in the Inuit language, Inuktitut, um, and are available on Isuma TV. These are, for instance, from the Inuit Broadcasting Corporation, which is an organization that has been doing video over the past, I believe, 30 years. There's uh, content from the Dene elders, from another indigenous communities, 193 episodes from their elders that were digitized and uploaded to Izuma TV. There's about 100 Cree programs, again, made by the Cree indigenous people from Canada. There's 20 original films that were uploaded from the National Film Board of Canada. They have their own channel, the NFP. You can see that there that there's like the, the address in every one of these channels is Isuma TV slash NFB or Isuma TV slash Video Cree. Here you have the Native Communication Society of the Northwest Territories, which stands for NCSNWT. But there's also uh, the Haida films. Right now we have 17 Haida films, and there will be way more coming because we're doing um, a film with the Haida people in British Columbia. And there's other films from Australia, Bolivia, Brazil, Norway, the entire collection of one of the biggest indigenous uh, video organizations in Brazil, which is called Video en las Aldeas. Uh, they have their entire collection on Isma TV. Uh, one of the biggest ones of Cuba as well. Um, they have a, a lot of their videos up there. So there's uh, more and more indigenous organizations and individuals coming into Isma TV. Why we started this was because, um, well, uh, Isma started this. Isuma was made, um, it's, a, it's a video organization uh, by Inuit from Iglulik, um, and they wanted to distribute their own films. They realized this was very, very difficult from a point of view of a distribution system. We started to put them on the internet and then realized that Iglulik and a lot of other um, communities in Canada were 247 times less equal than the rest of Canada in terms of cost per megabyte. What does this mean? Internet is very, very slow and very, very expensive, um, which basically doesn't allow people in these communities to watch video or upload video and then, in this sense, be part of the um, information era where everyone is, you know, uploading videos and using their mobile devices and watching videos from all around the world and communicating and having this um, education system or having uh, the health system go through, um, through internet. All of this is not possible with the current infrastructure of these communities. This is why we developed a technology after developing the platform of Isuma TV, which we um, call the media players or the local servers, basically to allow an, a more equal participation from the northern communities that we work with, with the rest of Canada. Um, why? Because we wanted to provide uh, a platform and network system that could allow the different organizations to address their concerns. Some want to do community movie screenings. 
Some others are interested in doing youth media training. Some others, like what we're talking right now with Katie, would like to um, have a, a network, and that's what we did with a project called Digital Indigenous Democracy, in which we facilitated the network to inform and consult in with people on the mining development. How did we do this? We mixed the local radio with their local television with the internet and um, put a, a lawyer to help us as well uh, with this. You see here in the picture, Lloyd Lindsay is a human rights lawyer. And on the left side is Zacharias Skunuk, who is the founder of Isuma and the founder of Isuma TV. He is uh, an Inuk who lives in Igluli, where Katie was telling you. And what we did is that they both addressed different things that were going on on the, on the Back in Land project and reframed it in a very simple way, translated to Inuk and the radio sessions that were broadcasted locally but also online to inform the people and to hear back their concerns. Then they did video interviews and, uh, and other um, information videos that, when the, that were there, um, broadcasted on the local television as well. So these things <coughs> People could participate calling on the radio or going to Zacharias and having a video in their own language, in their own way. Um, what really concerned us is how can indigenous people participate, not in a written form, not in the form that the mining or the government usually addresses people, which is on PDFs with with the legal terminology, with scientific terminology, uh, putting one date that, that is convenient to them to go to the community, but sometimes the community is not there because they're hunting, because they have other obligations. So how could we provide a platform where people could go there anytime at their convenience and upload a video that basically would allow them to talk or speak in their own language in, and, and value this oral culture. So this is what we did, and it's all available on Isuma TV slash DID. You can see the entire uh, platform. You can see that each of the participating communities has its own um, video page, has its own online radio, and has its own television. I will show you how it looks um, uh, just that. This platform can also help to strengthen the language and the culture, to improve the education and the job training uh, for projects uh, trying to improve the mental health and the community wellness, um, to create jobs and economic development. Um, as, as we said, after we created this project of DID and intervened in the Nunavut Impact Review Board meeting, after that, we partnered with other organizations to see how we could use this platform to continue to monitor the activities of the government and the activities of the mining um, company and continue to uh, hear the voices from the Inuit community that are affected, what were their concerns, their suggestions, what they needed to learn. So we did more videos and more radio interviews and this time it was actually paid by the Inuit organization that is responsible of keeping the Inuit of these affected communities informed and consulting them, but using our radio, television, and internet network. Um, it can also facilitate the regional cooperation between communities and, and the link between the different communities that are going through the same same issues. There's a lot of indigenous uh, communities around the world that are facing the same kind of challenges that the Inuit are facing right now with these natural resources. Um, it can also help to distribute the films. Uh, 
and we are like in some communities we are uh, installing projectors and screens and organizing screenings using the same technology and this helps in terms of again distributing the films when we're talking about uh, production companies because Usima started as a production company and then went more on into the distribution and here I, I could explain a little bit more from a technical point of view how does it work but basically a local server is kind of like a hard drive a hard drive that contains the entire content of the solar TV it means the 6,000 videos so you do have to connect to the internet to see the page that surrounds the video, but instead of the video coming from the World Wide Web, from the servers there, it comes from the local server that you have. So basically, you even if you have a very slow internet connection, you can watch the video and you can watch it in, in full quality and as fast as it goes. And we connect that local server, this technology allows us to connect that local server to the cable system in the community and broadcast through the community channel of these communities. We can also connect it to a Wi-Fi router, basically allowing people from their own computers or their own mobile devices to watch whatever is on the Super TV. Um, it's kind of like a hotspot. Or we can connect it to a projector and organize community screens. So that's how it works with the local server. And we also provide in, in the communities um, that, so to some of these participating communities, we sell um, an integrated system in which they have a video camera, whatever they need to edit, produce, upload these. And make their local radio so online. So basically, all the infrastructure that they need to create their own media and to broadcast these media through the world through Isola TV and locally uh, through their own television and through their own radio. I'm not going to go in detail because I know we have 20 minutes, so I'm just going to show you uh, here uh, the idea is. That right now we are in all these communities, so that means the entire backend user has all of these communities have their own equipment to create their own uh, media, and this is exactly the area that is protected by the Baffinland project that Katie was talking about. This is where the Mary River uh, mine is, and these are five communities that are mostly affected, uh, including Italo, which is the capital. So. What this allows is that instead of the, the organizations that have to inform and consult people, traveling to all these communities, which is extremely expensive, and they can only go one or two days every six, eight months, they can keep everyone informed through their televisions, through their radio, about what is going on, what's the new plan, what is the Mary River project wanting to do now, and what are the concerns of Igluli? And Igluli can listen to what pond inlet people have to stay, and Clyde River people um, can listen to what Arctic Bay has to say. I'm going to show you how that um, looks like. So if you go to, the, again, where I was showing you the communities, all of these communities have their own page, the participating communities. So if I go to Igluli here, I can see that here are the videos that people upload. This is precisely Louis Impact talking in the, at the national at the Nunavut Impact Review Board what his concerns are in Inuktitut. We can hear here um, Zacharias, and this is the community hall where people upload all of these videos. But you can also go to the television and see what they are broadcasting currently in Igluli. So. If I go here to the television, sorry, my internet is also not that uh, uh, fast. Here you can see all of the videos that they're watching in Igluli. And say you want to listen to the radio, which is not always online because they don't broadcast all the time, uh, you can listen to the radio and share your perspective here. 
and you can see other um, archives of the radio that have been uploaded and other radio stations in other communities. Again, if I go back to communities, I can go and see another community. So this time I won't choose the blue link, I, just, I choose RBS. And I see exactly the same structure, the picture of RBS and their own community uploads and their own television playlists. Each community is independent. They choose whatever they want to broadcast locally, but they can be in contact with the other communities. I'm going to leave it here so that people can ask whatever questions they have um, and to not uh, bombard it with information. <laughs> Quisiera agradecerle también tu presentación, es muy bueno. Thank you for your presentation, excellent presentation. I would like to also to ask you some questions. The theme that you talked about is very similar. We saw what Mario has done in these last years. We have worked in our community um, to, for those same objectives. And so what you are doing for the communities, uh, the new languages, you, the movies, uh, films use the language, the indigenous languages to present the people that live on this land do we use the original languages the um, first nation languages the indigenous languages of the people who live on these territories that's what i wanted to know it would help because people could then conserve their linguistic capacity, their transit, their traditions, because Mario and myself, we work on resistance as an issue in terms of natural resources and uh, land. Um, and so we want to defend uh, so now we use the mother tongue and maybe we can have subtitles in Spanish and maintain the usage of uh, native languages. Uh, thank you for your question. I'm going to show you an example. Uh, I think it will be more clear if we offer a platform and uh, we use our own channel, our own video that are upload, the videos that are uploaded, each communi community, each organization has their own channel and can upload their own uh, videos in their preferred language, the original language. You have uh, a video here, it's the organization, an organization from Brazil. As you can see here, uh, if I click on this video, you can see a video in a native 
of language, I can decide to add subtitles to it. For example, I can add subtitles in English, Portuguese, Spanish, English. Um, so, but uh, everything is done in the original language. That is why I'm saying there are more than 80 different languages. So this is the content on Isuma TV. Here's an example, the one among many. For example, a Cuban example, let's say, uh, uh, if I say here another choice uh, selection here, the Cuban selection. These are the videos they produced in Cuba. Um, it's a project uh, for Serana TV. Uh, we uh, have the, they have their own video, and uh, we uh, look at the, this content from different uh, sources. For example, I have festivals here, Sisuma TV, Clack uh, uh, Fee, a channel for the co a coordinating organization in Latin America for indigenous peoples. They have their own channel, Clack P, and they they have uploaded their videos, uh, videos of organizations uh, from Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, Guatemala, Mexico. Uh, every two years they meet up and they hold activities. So there's a thousand different channels like that, meetings, um, etc. The Latin American context is there. Everything we are offering here, Isuma, is the platform. Isuma TV. I don't know if I've answered your question. And, uh, uh, excuse us, but uh, I just understood. Maybe I wasn't clear in my question. I, so, there are documentaries, but how will you, well, what I mean is, how will they be able to use these documents to documentaries for development, let's say? Maybe it might help people to resist or to maintain the usage of their mother tongue. That's what I don't know. I know that you work. Uh, um, but uh, is it in the community only? Or what I mean is, can it be used to rebuild, maybe to defend land rights or defending um, or preserving uh, uh, traditional knowledge? Or Well, I don't know if I understand your question fully, but are you referring to the usage? How do we use that? Or what these videos are for? to defend the language. Um, is that your question? So, so we have different uh, fronts of action. The first uh, battleground is to offer a platform. This platform is a local one, and it is international as well. Second uh, aspect, we have different projects. So we get money thanks to the government of Canada and funding and um, to and bursaries and uh, to grants to work on certain projects. We work with Inuit communities, for example, people who uh, are referred to as Eskimos. Uh, they don't like being called that, but we call them Inuit. That's the right term. That's where we started the project. And so establishing um, relationships with other groups, other organizations with other regions of the world to see how we can um, have some experimentation with uh, and trying different things out with different projects. In the Canadian Arctic, for example, we get a grant from the Canadian government. We get a million dollars to create 
create an infrastructure and um, to deal with, to help these communities so that they can express themselves in their own language and this information can be sent to the government and the mining companies so that the um, uh, participation uh, is more equitable so that we can participate in the decision-making process in a better way uh, to work on giving life to these languages. We work with native communities, and it is one of the reasons uh, why Isumat TV that has created this platform is known as because of Atanal Juat, a movie that was done in 2008 that was done by the Inuit community. They used their own language, they used their own legends, the actors uh, for, from their community, their own costumes. They filmed it themselves in their own environment and the whole story of this movie rests on their culture and their beliefs and the legends uh, that uh, are within their culture. And so now the actors Actors have to learn their lines in ineptitude, and they must uh, give life to the past, to evoke the past. So that is part of the cultural aspect of the project. And that is pro this project, once it is done, is visible everywhere to for everybody in the Isomat platform. Anybody can download it, and you can uh, work on different projects like this. These projects are limited in a certain way to the Inuit community, but we share them with other communities, and each community has their own projects. We do not pretend to um, have projects that want to save and rescue all the languages of the planet. No, we just offer a platform upon which we can reflect different efforts and uh, f a fight for people's rights and interests, and so we allow or organizations to have access to this window on different projects that are being produced. Thank you. Report. Maximum for lunch. Uh, if there's any other uh, question or comment if I got for Gabriela, if you could come to the chair over here, because this computer is on a wire. The uh, and la batterie ne fonctionne plus pour you have to uh, be at the computer so Gabriela can hear you and uh, speak into the microphone so et parler dans le micro parce que pour que les traductions soient plus fort like to I think we we have a problem otra vez no 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 escucha We've, it looks like we lost the uh, Spanish the translation to Spanish again. Okay. Um, Je m'excuse. On doit traduire sur ce canal. Le canal français ne fonctionne pas. Bonjour, Gabriela. And uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for your presentation and your work. And uh, really, you have uh, opened up new horizons uh, for me anyway. And I hope that uh, there will be other opportunities uh, to uh, for our comrades, our friends, uh, our um, uh, associates and uh, colleagues in the First Nations and so we can work together in the future, maybe be thanks to local network systems, integrated media, uh, local uh, networks. And also, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful work. And so the time uh, for lunch has arrived. Um, we are actually 15 minutes late. And so we must now thank you. Thank you again. And uh, our distinguished uh, salutations and uh, a nice uh, round of applause as well.
Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, yes. Bye, Kitty. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I guess, uh, Katie, uh, I, I'm sure there's going to be uh, some desire for, for communication, uh, and uh, w part of our discussions, uh, you know, in the last day or two, uh, we're, we're going to come back to the question of platforms and, you know, how in Cicada we don't reinvent the wheel, but, but uh, provide maybe um, conduits to some of the, uh, the marvelous resources that are uh, already well established. So, if you can be our our channel vis-a-vis <laughs> uh, -vis Azuma, that would be wonderful. Thanks. Uh, and I guess we should move on to lunch now. Um, and we'll be back at one thirty. Thank you. Okay.